Yeah, good morning everybody. How are you today? I always just have this brief uh, intro introduction so you can get used to my deep southern accent. <laughs> so, uh, well yes, I am from Australia. I've been here 11 years now and actually our office is in Powder Springs uh, and uh, just down the road really. Um, our office is one of seven offices worldwide for Creation Ministries International. We employ lots and lots of scientists and I'm here to tell you this morning, particularly you young ones, when it comes to science, you don't have to park your brains at the church door on Sunday mornings. You're going to get confronted when you get into higher education and college and so part of what we do, I have six other, uh, sorry, seven of us uh, in the CMI office here and we travel all over America, uh, about 300 churches a year, normally when there's not COVID going on. And why, why do we do that? Well, it's to bring information to you, information to you and your families. That's what we call ourselves, an information ministry. And uh, I'll often like to, uh, to do a poll first thing in the morning with uh, people I talk to so that you can see what I'm about to talk about this morning is not, I believe, just one of the issues for the church uh, that we need to deal with. I think this morning, this creation versus evolution issue is the issue of all issues facing the church today. If we are to communicate the relevance of Christianity and the authority, authority of God's word today. So let me, now I'm not gonna pick anybody out, so don't worry, but I want some audience participation. So if you're here this morning, and maybe you've witnessed to your friends, your children, grandchildren, uh, colleagues at work about Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, and they ask you questions like this. Well, if the Bible's true, and we all came from Adam and Eve, who did Cain marry? All right, if the Bible's true, and we all came from Adam and Eve, well, what about all the different races? Where did they come from? Well, what about dinosaurs? How come I can't see dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? And, you know, they lived millions of years ago. Well, what about this one? Probably the number one question we get as a challenge to our faith, the nature of God is this. If, if God is a God of love, why does he allow all the death and suffering in the world? Why are there bad things happening? Now, just indulge me this morning. If you've ever heard, received questions like that, just pop your hands up. Now, keep them up, please, nice and high, because I want you to turn around and have a look. <laughs> now, I estimate that's probably 80 to 90% of you. And you know what? I only asked you four questions. <laughs> but people have dozens of questions in this area, don't they? And those questions, for them, are intellectual stumbling blocks into believing the truth claims of the Bible. So one of the great sources of information is our website. Our ministry has been going nearly 45 years, right? That website contains basically 45 years worth of research and it's all free. You can type into the search engine, well, what about carbon-14 dating, right? Because I'm not gonna have time to talk about that today and get answers to your questions. You can print them out, email, uh, text articles to your friends and family, etc. And I'm gonna give you the web address you might want to get your pens ready because I, I apologize, it's a very hard web address to remember. Creation.com. Think you can remember that this morning? So when you see something on the TV and they say, wow, look at this latest ape-man fossil we found in Africa. Here is evidence that humans evolved from apes two million years ago. Where do you go? Well, usually within a few days we'll have an answer on our website. And this morning, uh, if you want to sign up for our free emails newsletter, I know we're kind of being contactless, which is good, but uh, let me give you an example of how you can use it. Do you remember uh, this man, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter? Well, I don't know if you saw my uh, desktop when it came up, but uh, with the crocodile there, that was taken at his zoo, and it was just a couple of hours north of where I lived in Brisbane. But when he was killed by that stingray, Lots of people wrote to us on our website, Christians included, and said, why did a, a God of love design stingrays that kill people? How would you answer that? Well, we wrote an article and we put a small paragraph in our free email news called Infobytes, send it out to you with a link to the article. And here's the point. That article equips families, but then you click forward and send it on. Evangelism. So easy. That's all you've got to do. Forward it to your skeptical friends and the doubting Thomases out there. And within 10 days, that became the most visited article ever on our website at the time because of people sharing it. So if you picked up some bulletins this morning, you'll notice there's two parts to it at the top. If you want to get the free email news, just put your name, your email address and your zip code because uh, we can always let you know when this thing's happening in your area, okay? And 
Uh, Pastor, I hope it's all right this morning. I'm going to allow you to use your cell phones in church. Okay, I'm going to keep this number up for a little while, but you can text your email address and zip code to that number. All right. Or here we are for you uh, techies out there. Uh, If you want to scan that QR code, it'll just be a little drop down box and you can say, yes, I'm here in Gary Bates and it can connect you with that. If those forms or anything like that, you can do while I'm getting on with the major talk this morning. So really, this issue is not about science. All my scientists in the office, they got their degrees in the very same universities as their evolutionary believing counterparts. It's really a world view issue. That's the basis of how we interpret all the world around us. So I've pictured it here like this two, these two trees. These are the two major views, if you like, in America today. Humanism. Now, what does humanism mean? Humanism means that man decides truth for himself. You are the ultimate authority in this world. There's no God, no creator to be accountable to. Now, the foundation of that has to be evolution. Evolution and creation, they're the only two games in town. Either it was created, the universe, or it evolved. Now, look at the fruit on that tree. Some people would say, well, yep, they're the problems we have facing the church today. You know, murder, gay marriage, abortion. But I submit to you, they're not the problems. The reason I depicted it like a tree is because they are the fruit of, if you like, the symptoms of a foundational underlying problem, a belief that there is no God, no creator to be accountable to. You live, you die, that's it. Now contrast that with the tree of Christianity. You see, everything you and I need to know about the Christian faith, the nature of God and our need for salvation, someone tell me, where do we get that from? Where do we get that information from? The Bible, right. And right there in the very first verse, it sets it up for everything that follows along. In the beginning, God, meaning he was there, created the heavens and earth. He's the creator. And if you subscribe to that as your worldview, well, we should see fruit in accordance with that worldview, right? Abortion is wrong because man is made in the image of God. And because man is made in the image of God, all people everywhere are descendants of Adam. Yes. And and that question about races, well, guess what? Science has caught up because in the modern DNA revolution, every single person on this planet, do you know how closely related we are genetically? Over 99.9% of our DNA is similar. The differences are less than 1%, 0.1% of our DNA. So it shows you that, uh, yes, we do go back if you like, to a common ancestor, and his name was Adam. And here's going to be a focus today, because some of us have grown up in the church our whole life, and our our young ones are in the Sunday school or the youth group, and we see them powering on for the Lord today. But I know there are some of you here whose children, young ones, are not in the Lord. And one of the reasons is this key issue. I'm going to show you later. Because tomorrow in the public schools, it's not, you know, maybe or perhaps they will be taught evolution. They will be taught evolution as a scientific fact. They'll be shown all of this alleged evidence for the millions of years of history on the earth. And really, in all my 35 years of ministry, I've found that most people believe in evolution because they've never heard a clear explanation of the alternative. You see, here's that evolutionary tree. In fact, they call it the tree of life. But you can see, by the way, here's the uh, evolved pond scum down at the bottom. That's apparently where you and I came from. Makes you feel really special this morning, doesn't it? Millions of years of death and suffering, survival of the fittest, as someone called it, and it leads to your average civilized American there at the top, all right? (laughs) Or Australian. But that's not a tree of life, is it? That's a tree of death. Culling out the weak, getting rid of the unfit, out reproducing your competitors. And that's how they say death entered the world. That's how we explain bad things around us. But the Bible has a different view of death, doesn't it? It came in as a result of sin, rebellion, that still exists today in all of us. That's certainly something we did inherit from Adam. So that is the basis, evolution, of that non-Christian worldview. And I want to explain, you've heard the word word, worldview, obviously, before. But let me distill it down for you, because it's like a set of glasses, a filter, a framework, 
through which everybody, yes, everyone, even once we reach the age of understanding, we've already developed a worldview for ourselves. And they use it like a set of glasses or a filter for interpreting our world. And that non-Christian worldview says death, suffering, disease, bloodshed, that's what's been with us for millions of years and that's how we explain the world when we look out there. And I like to think about it this way. Our worldviews are primarily based upon what we often call the three big questions. You know what they are? Now Christians ask them and non-Christians too and they go like this. Where do we come from? Why are we here? What's our meaning and purpose to life? And the third one is what happens to us when we die. So let's go through these two scenarios. If evolution's true, answer to question one, is there any ultimate meaning and purpose to our lives? No, I mean, we're just the product of chance random processes over millions of years. What about any life after death under that scenario? No. You die, they bury you, put you in the ground, burn you up, that's it, it's all over. But if God is creator, are you and I created with meaning and purpose? Well, I hope you think so. <laughs> and what about life after death? Well, the choices you make in this life are going to affect where you spend eternity, aren't they? But do you notice something? The questions to two and three, the, sorry, the answers to questions two and three will always be determined by what you think about question one, created or evolved. Can you see that? So you're starting to see why I'm saying this is such a foundational issue in terms of developing people's worldviews. Well, let's line that up a little bit. Here's some students and one says to the other, that science class of yours went for ages. What happened? Well, the teacher says we're nothing special. Uh, we came from pond scum. We're just evolved apes. She asks, so what are they teaching in your next class? And she says, self-esteem. <laughs> Many a true word spoken in jest, right? So folks, boys and girls, what are we going to do about the science? You know, you hear the word science and evolution in the same sentence. And what we tend to think of when we hear the word science is what I would describe as a very well-defined area of science called operational or experimental science. You see? That's the type of stuff where we keep building upon former experiments, we get better at building technology like laptops, etc. But when we're dealing with the past, creation or evolution, events that we were not there to see, we're dealing with something that allegedly happened in history, historical science. You see? And that's that idea they think that life evolved over millions of years. Let's have a closer look at it. Operational science, if you like, is the experimental method. You know, you can do experiments in the present, you can repeat them, test them, and build upon those results. So if I did a, an experiment to test the boiling point of water today, I'd do it today, tomorrow I keep getting the same result, and I notice when it boils, this gas escapes, steam, and I think, wow, if I capture that, you know, get a wheel, get some copper wires, and I keep improving, and suddenly, you know, I can generate electricity, something like that. But what about the idea there was a big bang, one-time event that occurred 13.7 billion years ago? Anybody see that? Can you repeat it? Can you test it? What about dinosaurs evolving into birds 65 million years ago? Same thing. You can't. These are belief systems about the past. And don't say, oh, that's because evolution is just a theory. You'll get shot down for that one because actually in the universities, in the academic world, a, a scientific theory actually does have experimental support. So I could call it the theory of gravity, for example, right? So here, did you observe it? Let's test it and I can repeat it. <laughs> but evolution is less than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's just a, a hypothesis, a belief system, a philosophy, if you like, about how the world came to be in the past. And I often like to tell this story about my experience in my first trip to South Africa. Some Christians have brought along a, a young uh, atheist, self-professed atheist, and he got in my face at the end of the meeting and he got, said, you creationists, he said, you talk about operational science, he says, and you ignore examples of it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, fossils. Everybody knows that fossils take millions of years to slowly form. I tell you, if I had a dollar for every time somebody raised fossils to me, I would be a very, very rich man. And I showed him this picture. And here we've got what's called a, uh, it's an extinct marine reptile known as an ichthyosaur, about six feet long. And what's really neat about it, well, there's the baby coming out of the birth canal. Hmm. Now let me ask you, was that slowly giving birth over millions of years while it was slowly being fossilized? What do you think? No. Something rapid and catastrophic had to happen to it 
to preserve it in this instance in the, the rock record, okay? Now, I'm going to show you what's the standard view in our textbooks today in high school. You can go on the internet. In fact, this picture's from my grade 11 biological science textbooks in Australia. And if you go along there, there's the fish swimming along, and they say he sinks to the ocean floor. See that in the middle? Now look at the last slide. While he's lying on the ocean floor, look at these high mountains. They've disappeared. Slow erosion, right? A little bit of sediment, uh, some water filters out, carries those particles, buries the fish on the ocean floor, and it becomes fossilized, and the process starts again, and that's how we get that geologic column we see in our textbooks. But how do you get a fossil like that using that process? Because let me ask you, I don't know if any of you have been scuba diving or snorkeling, or maybe you've watched those nature documentaries about the ocean. Do you notice all the thousands of dead sea creatures on the ocean floor waiting to be fossilized? See, what do you think happens to a fish when it dies in the wild? Is it going to float? No, it's going to sink, isn't it? You're all looking at me like absolutely stunned mullets this morning, I tell you. <laughs> Go home tonight, try it if you've got some expensive tropical fish. Uh, you only need a teaspoon of cyanide and a full fish tank, I've noticed, and find out whether your goldfish sinks or floats when he dies, all right? <laughs> now, Obviously, it's going to float, and then it's going to get eaten. It might sink to the bottom then, but then the crabs and everything else, when they finished with it, you're lucky if you're going to have a piece of backbone left after a couple of days. But, you see, what they're saying is, look, uniformitarianism. We see those slow processes today, therefore it must have been like that for millions of years in Earth's history. But to get fossils like that ichthyosaur that I showed you, and we have literally hundreds of millions of fossils like that. What you need, here's old Freddy fish swimming along, you need a lot of mud and a lot of water in a short amount of time. You can bury the fish quickly in those layers and before long you can get yourself a rapid fossil. Now some of you are thinking, well, hang on Gary, that's a bit simplistic. Yes, things can be buried quickly, but the process of fossilization, it's called permineralization, is where the organic material is slowly replaced and turned to stone. That takes a long, long period of time. Well, if you think that, you'd actually be wrong because fossils can occur very quickly under the right conditions. Here's one of my favorites. This was a soft felt hat buried in a volcanic explosion in New Zealand and 20 years after the eruption, they found this cabin and it was buried and this hat along with other artifacts had been turned into pieces of solid rock in just less than 20 years. You just need the right set of conditions to get yourself a rapid fossil. Here's another one. Um, the, uh, a family uh, in Australia, and by the way, notice my subliminal advertising as we go along for Creation Magazine. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get that. It's our number one resource. And all this information I'm showing you today, these pictures, that's where that came from, from Creation Magazine. So a family walking along a beach in Australia, they noticed that rock was a little different to the others, and he said, I kicked it over and got a surprise because in the rock was a toy car. Now I can show you lots of examples, I don't have time this morning, but I will have more examples tonight at five when I'm talking about dinosaurs. But you just need the right set of conditions to get rapid fossils and rocks. And yet the thing is, you see, the evolutionists would say it's the rock layers with the fossils in them that is evidence of millions of years of Earth's history. Were they there when they were laid down? See, we're intimidated because we only hear that one view. We think, wow, they've got all this evidence for evolution. But they don't. Creationists and evolutionists, we have the same facts. We've got the same fossils, the same rocks, the same universe to discover. But we come to differing conclusions about how it came about because our starting assumptions are different. That's it. We interpret data according to our belief system, our worldview, and then we claim it's evidence for our cause. Now, I know most of you here probably don't believe in evolution, but if you're like a lot of Christians, you probably struggle with the idea that the earth might be only thousands of years old. We call that the biblical age of the earth. We get the age from the Bible. So the next section is really important. The whole concept, as I've been saying, of deep time comes from the rock layers. And I'm going to use the Grand Canyon here as an illustration. In fact, I was just watching a documentary on TV last night that said there is a billion years of Earth's history here. Now, the canyon itself is assumed to be about 500 million years old, half a billion years. And why? 
So if you look at the screen, can you see these colored bands of rock? There's light and dark alternating. That's called strata. And in the strata are very, very fine layers called sedimentary layers. And the idea is that water carried sediments in or wind blew in dust and sediments and it settles and each layer takes a year and so they see hundreds of millions of layers, they assume hundreds of millions of years of Earth's history. And then we're told, wow, look at the Grand Canyon itself. The, the Colorado River must, must have wound its way and slowly eroded that over tens of millions of years. Now, if I said, who's heard stories like that? Actually, every one of you has heard that story on the Grand Canyon. And they say, look, there's evidence of deep time. Well, if you've ever been around creation material very much, you know we love to use this event at Mount St. Helens in uh, Washington State in 1980. In fact, let me share with you this morning, this one piece of evidence is what turned me from an old earth evolutionist into a Bible-believing creationist. Mount St. Helens, they knew it was going to erupt, the mountain was swelling, and you can see how it was venting at the top, but it didn't blow its top, it blew its side. Look at that. One third of the volcano basically vanished in a few seconds. It blew lumps of rock as big as a city block over six miles from the blast site. But ladies and gentlemen, this is just a baby when we consider some of the geologic events in Earth's history. And what's interesting, after the initial eruption, it laid down bands of strata, just like we see in the Grand Canyon, right? Those thick bands. And see this middle section? There's a lady at the, there for scale at the bottom. But that middle section, you can see the very, very fine laminations, they're called. Now remember, we're traditionally taught to interpret those kind of one per year. And in that 21-foot bank of sediment, there are thousands of those sedimentary layers. Did they take thousands of years to lay down? No, in fact, that middle section was laid down precisely on June 12, 1980, in just three hours as a result of the catastrophic events of Mount St. Helens. There's the dates for the other two bands there. All happened rapidly. And when you go back to Mount St. Helens now, there are canyons all over the place. They call this one Engineer's Canyon. Can you see the little river running through it there, the North Fork of the Toodle River? And let's do a self-check because of the way we've been taught to interpret these things, we look at that and say, wow, that little river must have snaked through and eroded it over a long period of time. But the reason it's called Engineers Canyon is Army Corps engineers were attempting to divert water from nearby Spirit Lake that had overfilled from the volcanic eruption and they eroded it into this little area and carved that canyon out in a matter of eight months. <laughs> and don't think the material was soft and just kind of flushed away, the floor of the canyon is basalt, solid basalt, hard volcanic rock. And you can see what are called striations, which is the scouring of the rock where it's been eroded by fast flowing mud and water. You see, it's not a little bit of water, a little bit of sediment over a long period of time. A lot of mud, a lot of water, a lot of sediment over a short amount of time can do an incredible amount of geologic work. And when I look around the world, well, what do we see? Yes, we do see all these rock layers with billions of dead things in them, fossils. And they say, look, millions of years of evolutionary history on the earth. But Pastor Patrick stole my thunder this morning because is there an event in the Bible that could explain that, do you think? I mean, I'll give you a clue, it covered the whole earth. <laughs> the flood. And here's the kicker. Someone here, tell me how long the flood lasted. Now it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, the flood waters were upon the earth for 12 months, one year. So if most of those geologic layers were laid down by the events of Noah's flood, where did the millions of years just go? It's not there, is it? If there's no millions of years, there's no time for evolution to happen. Mm. Can you see why the age of the earth is such an important issue? On, you know, because to be honest, it's also one of the easiest things for us to explain. You know, again, I'll mention that all that stuff came from Creation Magazine, but I want to just talk about these six days of creation. Because there are lots of different views people have to try to fit deep time, millions of years, in those early chapters of Genesis. When I was a young Christian, I was still an evolutionist, I thought I was really clever when I found that passage there in 2 Peter 3.8. You know, day in the Lord's like a thousand years. Well, it goes on and says a thousand years are like a day. So what does that mean? It's actually an analogy. 
It's talking about the patience of God, the fact that he's outside of time and he's not willing that any should perish. It's not talking about creation. That's a, a passage being used out of context. Ladies and gentlemen, there are all these different views. Well, couldn't have been a global flood. We don't have global floods today. But as I've shown you, the evidence is everywhere around the world for a global flood. God used evolution. He lit the fuse of the Big Bang, the gap theory, that there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, and there was a Lucifer's flood in there that destroyed everything. But they can't happen because Lucifer, Satan, was a fallen angel. He could not have fallen before day six of creation when God said everything was very good. There is no time there. It was an attempt to put the millions of years in Genesis, the framework hypothesis. Watch out if you're off to Bible college, they'll teach you that Genesis is just poetry, not to be taken literally. But let me deal with this one, the day-age theory, a ministry in the US called uh, Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Bross, he says, the word day, he says, can mean an indefinite period of time. And he's actually correct. But we always understand the meaning of words from the context they're used in. And I want to focus on this because this is one of the popular things that Christians do to, to fit deep time in the Bible. The days could be millions or billions of years. So let me give you an example this morning. If I said to you, it took me three days to fly from Brisbane, Australia to Hartsfield Jackson Airport. How many 24-hour days did I just speak about? Not a trick question. <laughs> three, thank you. And you can answer that very quickly because... I defined the context for you. When I put a number in front of the object, the word day, right, it's called an ordinal, you automatically process it as a 24-hour day. And if I said, hey, come back this evening, I'm going to be talking about dinosaurs, and at 6.15, why does a good God allow bad things? Right, you know the evening I'm talking about as part of a day. Right? Now, let me change the context on you. Answer this one. I'd like to tell you a story about something that happened back in my father's day. How many 24-hour days am I talking about? Someone, quick, quick. Can't do it. Because <laughs> I didn't define it for you. Okay, so day can mean a different thing, but watch out for the bait and switch because what is the context in Genesis? Genesis 1 verse 5, God called the light day, darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, there was one day. Three definers of the context for you. We go on, there was evening, there was morning, there was the second day. Do you know what's coming next? <laughs> there's evening, there's morning, there's the third day. Am I starting to annoy you yet? Um, I didn't write it though. Six times over, three definers of the context. I mean, I have to be frank here, if God really wanted to define them as 24-hour days, couldn't he have made it any clearer? And the word day in Hebrew is yom. And when we look elsewhere in the Old Testament at the word yom, when it's used, it appears with a number 410 times. Evening plus morning without the word day. Evening morning with the word day. Night with the word day. All these different combinations, it appears 532 times. And nobody ever questions any one of those passages as anything but a 24-hour day. So that would be the wrong hermeneutical approach, wouldn't it? And when you think about it, you know, one of the things dealing with the aliens, UFO subjects, it's, it's kind of made me a bit of a space junkie. <laughs> and trying to wrap my head around the universe. My goodness. But you know what? If he created it in six days, he could have created it in six seconds. Why six days? Well, there's the basis for your working week. We don't get our seven-day week, by the way, from the Bible. <laughs> oh, sorry, we, sorry. Let me say that again. We get our seven-day week from the Bible. There's no astronomical reason why we have a seven-day week. A day is a rotation of the earth. Lunar cycles give us months. The earth goes around the sun a year. Seven-day week comes straight from Scripture. But here's the real key point. See, I mentioned earlier, on day six of creation, you know, remember those days God saw what he'd made? It was good, good, good. And day six was very good. And the Hebrew word there, term, is tov miod, which means perfection, completion. So I want you to consider this. If the evolutionists are right, right, and all those rock layers with those dead things are in them, they say that's a record of disease, suffering, death upon the earth. So 
would Adam and Eve, who clearly the Bible indicates only lived a few thousand years ago, would they have been standing on this fossil graveyard beneath them and God looks down and says, yes, that's very good. See, there's a huge theological disconnect there. And here's the, the key issue, you see, because even if you don't believe in evolution, please listen carefully, but you try to add millions of years to the Bible, the millions of years comes from the rock layers, the rock layers have death in them, we've just put death before the fall. Now we've got a gospel problem. And New Testament, there's over 100 references in the New Testament to the book of Genesis, do you know that? Genesis 1 to 11, specifically. It says there in Romans 5.12, we all know this one, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all men because all sinned. There it is. There was no death and bloodshed before Adam. He's the one who brought it in. Remember I said at the beginning, evolution is all about death. That's what led to human beings, the pinnacle of the evolutionary tree. But the Bible says it was our actions. See, because that original creation was very good. And who messed it up? <laughs> Me. It's my fault. And even though we are responsible for messing up God's perfect creation, he sends a rescue mission. The creator himself, the only one who could pay the penalty of death for our sin, took it upon himself to redeem us so we can be reconciled with him again in the future. So should we take Genesis literally? Well, if Genesis is not real literal history with a literal very good creation, with a literal Adam and Eve, and if sin did not literally enter the world through their actions, and ladies and gentlemen, you and I literally don't need to be saved from anything. <laughs> it's kind of where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? If Genesis is not true, there was not a literal fall, then we literally don't need to be saved from anything. What did Jesus die for? You see, the book of Revelation explains it. Here's the second last chapter in the whole Bible. It says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And look at this. This is the last chapter. There it's talking about in the New Jerusalem is the tree of life again. And there shall be no more curse. What curse is it talking about? The one in Genesis chapter 3. The very last chapter is talking about the undoing of what went wrong. And you know, if God created over millions of years of death and suffering and some evolutionary process, I mean, and we subscribe to that, are we looking forward to that in the new heavens and earth? And how long does the new heavens and earth take to create? Well, it's not very clear, but it just says, and behold, I saw a new heavens and earth. Maybe it's instantaneous. How can God do that? Because he's the creator. <laughs> That's how come he can do it. Now, I've given you very brief, briefly this morning an indication there are answers. And I mentioned it earlier that the focus should really be, I think, on evangelism, starting in the home. If you think, I'm sorry to say this, if you think that your children are going to grow up in, in the faith by virtue of the fact they're attending church today and they're in a Christian family, not my words, you will be mistaken. The Southern Baptists... Their own surveys say that they're losing 88% of their young ones. Every denomination in the United States. And it's been very difficult for us as speakers to try to communicate that because you see happy kids in the church today. But remember what they are going to be taught. So a few years ago, I took a film crew and I went on to college campuses around Atlanta. And with the, the young ones there, basically I just asked four questions. The first one as students walked past was, were you raised in the church or not? And if they said no, we, we let them move on. We only wanted these kids who were raised in the church. And the next question was very simple. Evolution or creation, what's true? And out of the hundreds of students we surveyed, only five said they still believed in biblical creation. The next question. When you were in the church, did your pastors, parents, leaders, anybody show you the wealth of scientific evidence to show that biblical creation might be true? Ladies and gentlemen, every single student who said they now believed in evolution said they'd never ever been shown any information. The five students who said they still believed, every one of them was shown information. And the last question was, do you still attend church? 
and all those students who said they now believed in evolution, except for one young man, and we put him in the video to show we were not stacking the deck, no longer attends church. And the five who, who responded positively said they still attend church. Yeah, every Sunday. Wow, there you go. So that's from real experience. And I have to be honest to you, with you, I knew exactly what we were going to get when we went out there. And you can go to creation.com, fall out, and have a look at that. I love what uh, this professor, Mike Adams, says on a conservative website. He says this. He said, if Christianity dies in America, it will not be for a lack of the evidence of its truthfulness. It will be for a lack of the dissemination, the sharing, the spreading of the evidence of its truthfulness. And so that's why we go to churches, to take it to churches where the people are, where the families are. And those books there, I want you to know, we're faith funded. We don't even ask for a speaking fee when we come to churches. All we say is let us get the materials out into people's hands. So I'm gonna share some of that with you in a moment. Uh, the website, as I said, uh, uh, there's now nearly 15,000 articles on there and it's all free. If you don't get your question answered today, type it into the search engine. We've got packs out there. The Answers Book, it's called The Answers Book because it the, has the 65 most asked questions on creation versus evolution. You know, Cain's wife, where did the water come from from the flood? Where did the water go? How do we see distant starlight apparently millions of light years away if we think the universe is only thousands of years old, etc. Now, every Christian home should have a copy of that book, but you can get it in a pack where you get three for the price of two. Refuting Evolution Behind is the largest selling creation book of all time. It deals with basic high school science that is taught in the curriculum in this country. And they have study guides with them. You can sit down and do them with your family. Geology. Remember what I said? That's the culprit for millions of years. Now, don't think this is a children's book. It's an adult book in disguise. But you will learn a great deal uh, if you, even if you sit down with your family. Exploring geology with this character. Um, it's interesting, it's not hokey, very, very informative. And it will help immunize your children from you know, being told there's evidence for millions of years around. There's a companion dinosaur book. Uh, elementary age books. There's five there in a pack, discounted, designed to be read to a child. And there are parent helps and notes in the back to help your children get started on this subject. But if all the stuff I've said to you this morning is kind of, ah, I've heard all that before, Gary, and you wanted something meaty, uh, Dr. Jonathan Safety, one of my colleagues, this 800-page commentary on Genesis 1 of 11. If you want a one book that covered everything, that's it. If you're a reader, it can just be read straightforward like a normal book. And we also made that into a 12-part teaching series. All of those talks, no longer than 40 minutes each, they're great to circulate amongst Bible study groups, etc. Work your way through them, and there are study guides again to all of these. A couple more, because you're going to know what to look for. We have churches buying literally hundreds and hundreds of copies of these to give to their young ones. It's called the Creation Survival Guide, How to Graduate with Your Faith Intact. It basically says, here, teenager... This is what you're going to face in higher education. Understand when you're told this, why people are saying that. It's trying to you know, give them some level of discernment. And here's one that comes up all the time. Isn't the Bible just a book written by men? <laughs> Had that one? A little $3.50 booklet. How do we know the Bible's inspired? How do, how do we end up with the books we had, etc.? And look at this. In the back, we put a chart. And you can see the 2,800 cross-references in the 66 books of the Bible. They're like a blur, showing you the incredible unity of Scripture, despite the fact it was written over a great amount of time and in different countries, etc. And of course, there's uh, my book out there and the movie. But our last thing is Creation Magazine, and this is really the one thing you should get, because it's very easy to read, uh, and you can share it with others. Now, I didn't mention radiometric dating, but here's an example. This is a piece of volcanic rock, and we know the age of the rock from the volcanic explosion was 50 years, okay? We sent that off to a radiometric dating lab and it came back with an age of 1.35 million years. How is that? Now, please understand, when I'm here criticizing evolution, we're not talking about mass conspiracy, it's the way people interpret the data, okay? And that's obviously can't be 1.35 million years old, can it? What about this one? Boys and girls, a fossilized teddy bear. 
obviously millions of years old, right? They hang these in a cave in Yorkshire, England, and they become permineralized in just a few months. I've actually got one. It was given to me uh, as a gift there. So, oh, let me go through here. Some testimonies. We get more testimonies from the magazine than any other resource. This young man, look what he said. Your work was very important for me becoming a faithful believer in the Bible. I was an atheist, convinced of evolution until a year ago. And I started to listen to those crazy young earth believers trying to disprove them. And here I am now. Praise the Lord. See, remember I said they never get to hear the other side. And this young man, my first trip back to Australia, I'll never forget it. That's why I use it. He came up to me and started to break down and cry because he just wanted to thank the ministry. Thank the ministry. And he says that uh, some friends bought him a subscription to the magazine. So they paid for it, got it posted to him. He read it. And he said, my faith was never shaken by evolution. And now he's a Sunday school teacher in the church. Information makes a difference. As I said, we don't have to park our brains at the church door on Sunday morning. So in your, uh, in your sorry, uh, those bulletin inserts, if you didn't pick one up, they're out the back. Okay. And what happens if you sign up for one year for the magazine today, which is 29, uh, sorry, what is it? $30. You get the first issue for free today. We don't have to wait for it to be posting uh, to you, the current issue. Uh, you also get the digital version for free. So put your email on there. We send you the digital version. And the beauty with this is we allow you to share it. Send it to your children. Send it to your grandchildren by email. Just forward. So again, equipping you and using it for evangelism. Now, if you sign up for two years, okay, which is $50, it's cheaper, you're going to get the first issue today, the digital version, and we're going to give you a free documentary DVD. And we made this for the anniversary of Charles Darwin's uh, book, on, that, on um, obviously, uh, that started it all. We retraced his voyage on the Beagle. It's a high-class documentary. And also, we're going to give you that DVD survey that I did on college campuses right here in Atlanta. And you'll hear the questions that I asked. And you know what? When I said to them, what is your best evidence for evolution? You'll see it on the DVD. What was your, what's your best evidence for evolution? Guess what they said? The rocks, the fossils, the rocks, the fossils, the rocks, the fossils. And as I said, the easiest thing for us to answer, ladies and gentlemen. So you can see there, sorry, uh, there, one year, two years, tick which one you want in the box, bring it to our volunteers at the table, and they're just outside. You would have seen them as you're coming in, and they'll give you the current issue of the mag, and they'll also give you your DVDs today. All right? The pastor mentioned this passage, actually. Our worship leader did this morning, always being ready. Now, I'm sure you've heard information this morning you've never heard before. And it sounds so simple. And in Europe, why? Because it is. The way we look at our world around us. And when you get questions, you, well, you've got a great source you can go to. And make sure you tell others about creation.com and Creation Ministries International. I'll be at the book tables if you do have questions. And I thank you for your attendance. Thank you. <laughs>